and months trying to teach myself how to code. And when the opportunity came up to take a course from the Code Institute, I thought, do you know what, I'll give it a go. The advantages of taking a structured course, I thought, and actually I find having completed the first module, is that you're actually working along content that's been created by programmers and educators in the area um, that are geared up and know how to get people into a career in programming. The other thing I like is that I'm going along with another, um, other people, uh, another, the cohort that are taking the course. And it's quite nice that twice a week I can log on to our stand-up calls and ask any questions to the facilitator of the course and actually interact with the other people taking the course as well. So that's really nice. I wanted to share with you what the fundamental or the basic things that I've learned through taking the first module of the course. This would be useful if you are interested in becoming a programmer uh, you're really at the beginner level because this is quite, I suppose, it isn't um, really starting from the ground up and building that knowledge. So I came to this course with very limited programming knowledge. What I'm going to do in this video, I'm going to walk through what I've learned so far in the first module. So it starts off with some of the absolute uh, fundamentals of programming, starting with the different types of programming languages, because I didn't know there are actually two different types. So the first one is compiled uh, language and the second one is interpreted. So the advantages with a compiled language is that they run much faster once they're developed but the disadvantage is that it can be slower to actually develop them and program them because you have to run the entire thing every time and that can be quite a slow process. The interpreted languages then on the, on the other hand they're a little bit quicker and easier to develop and to program because you can run them code by uh, line by line and you don't have to compile the entire thing in order for it to run. So it's easier to get it developed. However, it can take a little bit longer for the machine to actually run the code. So a compiled language will run faster, but an interpreted language is a little bit easier and quicker to develop. The other thing we learned about is what algorithms are. Now I had only really, really heard of algorithms when it comes to like social media and how the different posts are shown to you through an algorithm. But actually what an algorithm is, is a step-by-step -step process that leads to a certain outcome. So you could think of an algorithm for making a cup of tea. You're going to boil the kettle, you're going to get the cup, you're going to pour the kettle, the water into the cup, you're going to put the tea bag in and blah blah blah. So you have the step-by-step -step process that leads to the outcome. In this case it would be a cup of tea. And that's basically what an algorithm is. And you can use a flowchart in order to be able to depict that in the exact steps that are included in that algorithm. So the, the language that we have been learning about then in the Code Institute course is Python. And as far as I can see, there are a lot of things that Python, with learning the, how to use Python, you're learning some fundamental skills. So we're learning about variables and how variables are like little boxes uh, where you store certain information as well. So we can store lists, which are basically a list of different items or possibly a dictionary is a different list type or different information type. And you can store that to a variable. All the variable is is a name, you have a name for the variable and you store such and such a data in that variable. We've learned about logic, how we can get a program to do different things dependent on conditions. So let's say with our boiling our kettle, we can say is the, we're boiling our kettle, we will ask then is the water boiled? In the case no, then we would say heat the water again or <laughs> find a better kettle. If we say yes, then the, the next step would be initiated. And we use if else statements in order to be able to allow that flow to happen. The other thing we're learning about is loops. And this is a, um, a thing, I suppose, that allows a program or code to be rerun every time the condition is true. So let's say there are two different types of loops. We've got for loops or while loops. With a for loop, the program will run over and over and over for each iteration of a item in a list. So say we have a list of one, two, three, four, five, a list of numbers. That for loop will run for each item in that list. When it gets to the end of the list, it will end. The other type of for or the other type of loop is a while loop. So this will continue to run and rerun and rerun while the condition is set to true. If the condition is in false, it will stop the loop. Let's say we have a piece of code that asks the user, do you want a cookie? When that user inputs yes, there will be a while loop and it says while the answer is yes, 
it will say here's a cookie then it will ask again do you want cookie so if that answer is then yes again it will run again and say here's a cookie but if the answer is no so then the while loop becomes false it will end the loop so these are really important kind of ways we can get our code to rerun and rerun until we get to a specific answer or while a condition is set to true so a boolean is a result that can uh, means a result that can only have one or two possible values and that is either true or false so like with that last example while the answer was set to true that boolean value was true the code will run and run and run once it's set to false and our boolean value is false then the code will cease to run the next thing we learned about them was functions and functions are basically containers for a longer piece of code that uh, contain a certain program and we contain that within a function the function is written with beginning with a def for definition so def and then the function name and then uh, a opening and closing parentheses and then a colon that's what a function looks like and then that function can be called anywhere in your program so instead of you having to type out the whole thing we just need to call the function and we make it so that we don't need to keep rewriting the same code and the same lines over and over again so it makes our code much more precise one of the other sections in the course in the first module was about coding best practices so our best best practices when it comes to coding include includes commenting so this is when we have a hash at the start of our line. So this code, this line isn't run by the program and we are describing what the piece of code following it does. And this helps other developers that may well be looking at your code understand what's going on. The other thing to, to note about Python, which may be different with other languages, it, well, it is different with other languages, is it uses snake case. So between each word, you actually write an underscore you keep everything in lowercase, but there is an underscore between each word. Something like JavaScript actually uses camel case, which in order to sort of separate the words, the first word is all in lowercase, but the next word has a capital letter at the start of the word. There's no spaces or anything in between. The last thing then we covered within the first module of the Code Institute course was requirements and testing. So there are different types of requirements that a program needs to adhere to, I suppose, whenever it's being made, whenever it's being programmed. And we want to keep, we want to have functional requirements and that's what a program actually does. And then we have non-functional non requirements. The non-functional non requirements are things like performance, scalability, usability, and security. So you can imagine those are things that are very important, but it's not actually what the program does day to day. So a functional requirement would be it needs to play this video. A security, a non-functional requirement would be something like it needs to securely store user information or user data. And then in order to test these requirements, so once a program is actually created, we need to test it that it actually uh, carries out the, the, what it needs to do, the requirements that are set at the start. How do we test that then? So there are two different types of testing methods. We have a black box method and we have a white box method. So the black box method then is only concerned with the results. Does the program come out with the right results? The white box method then is also concerned with how it got to that result. So it actually looks at the how it got to the final result. Whereas the black box method isn't concerned with that, it's just concerned with it coming up with the right result and doing the right thing. So those are the main topics that we've covered in this first module. And yeah, it is great to be able to be following a curriculum rather than just sitting online, watching YouTube videos, going along with things like Code Academy. Although these are great resources, don't get me wrong, in order to be able to practice some of these um, principles. It's nice to be able to follow a curriculum alongside a cohort of other people that are also doing the same. I hope this, you find this video useful. If you're interested in um, becoming a programmer, learning about it a little bit more, I definitely look into the Code Institute if you are interested in that. I know they have a free five day challenge in order to get give you an idea of what it's like um, being able to program. And it's, I've done that actually a couple of times even before I started this course. So I definitely recommend that. And I also, I like those other resources I've said, things like Free Code Camp or Code Academy, I'm just watching YouTube videos on programmers and what they do day to day. I find that really interesting as well. So I definitely recommend doing that if you are interested at all in becoming a programmer. I hope you find this video useful and happy coding.